song that Jerry, the country music singer, used to sing. So we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. So I might just go ahead and start so we get the mic fixed, okay? Uh, I am Bernard Myers. If you're from Ohio, I'm Bernard. If you're from East Tennessee, I'm Bernard. And if you're from Cage Cove, I'm Bud. I've carried that nickname for years. My oldest brother gave me that nickname, Bud. And it finally dawned on me that my dad, our dad, had a team of mules one of them's name was Bud. <laughs> but Bud was a good mule. Oh, Bud the mule was easy going, easy to get along with, very intelligent. <laughs> You didn't have to yell at him. You could speak to him in a normal voice when you're plowing the garden. You come out to the end of the road, you say, Whoa, bud, Jew, Paul. And he listened well, too. I hope that in my 87 years on this earth that I've took up a few of those tricks myself. These stories are about my favorite couple. And you'll notice I have a notebook. My memory just isn't what it once was. <laughs> <laughs> These stories were told to me by kinfolk and friends, and especially my older brother, Theodore. Thee, as we called him. As Sherman was the one, uh, Theodore was, was the one that Sherman always called on when there was work to be done. Didn't matter if it was getting a winter slot of wood or holding corn or putting up there or whatever. Uh, no ridicule or disrespect is intended or accepted for my own sermon. He was a man that I loved and admired when I was a youngster. Gatlinburg had a Wally Oakley. Case Cove had Daniel Sherman Myers. The only difference was Uncle Sherman never got the exposure and rubbed his elbows with the rich and famous like Mr. Oakley did. He, Mr. Oakley, as most of you know, he was a well-known mountain guide here in Sevier County, especially up around Gatlinburg. I think he worked for one of the hotels up there, and he would take the people on trips to the mountains. He took people like uh, Henry Ford, Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt and John D. Rockefeller, just to name a few. He was well known and he traveled widely and his stories were enjoyed in New York and Chicago, places like that. And there's another man that will be mentioned in the story, John Wright Dunn. He was a, a local man there in Townsend. He was our postmaster for years. And he always referred to Sherman as Uncle Sherman. They were good friends. And John Wright was spinning the arm to him. He was good at that. Daniel Sherman Meyer was born in 1888 to Peter and Margaret Shields Meyer. Grandmother Maggie was Irish, as they come. And of course, Peter was German. He, our ancestors, ancestors came out of Germany in the 17th century. Um, Sherman quit school at the fourth, after the fourth grade to work on the farm. The only requirement was that you be as long as the hoe handle it was that you're going to be using in the field of and corn. That hard work on the farm turned a tall, lanky teenager into a six foot three 
200 pound plus man. He is very strong from his upper body was built up from pulling a crosscut saw and swinging a double bitted axe. His resume included mule scanner, logger, teamster, farmer, and sometimes moonshiner. <laughs> if push come to show, he would make a little liquor every now and then. <laughs> now being from, being from East Tennessee, I may use some expressions that some of you have never heard before. So if I get, if I say something wild, you just flag me down. Uh, Sherman first married Angie Cable in 1910. Uh, she flew and uh, got tired of his shenanigans and divorced him. He was a man out of place here in East Tennessee. He should have been born out in one of the old cow towns out west. After the divorce, Uncle Sherman married Paralee Gregg, P-A-R-A-L-E-E. -E. It's an odd name I've never seen before or since. She was a tiny woman, but she might have weighed 100 pounds if she was soaking wet. But she could hold her on with Sherman when she got robbed. <laughs> I think probably more than likely she had some Native American blood flowing in them veins. Sherman said she was cute as a butt and wouldn't marry me unless I agreed to have the first baby. <laughs> <laughs> I remember boys, they were unable to have children of their own, and I, but I remember boys that uh, lived with them growing up when these young fellows needed some help. Uncle Henry Myers was, was the older brother. He moved to Georgia, Fannin County, Georgia, in the early 1920s. And he would, he would come back every fall to visit his mother and to visit Ken folks there in, in the cove. And I'm sure that he would tell Sherman how well the corn growed along those creek banks there in Georgia. His farm resembled Cage Cove tremendously. It was between mountains with a creek running through it. It just wasn't as big as Cage Cove. And I'm sure that he would tell Sherman how well the corn grew along those fertile creek banks and how much more profitable it was to sell to the court than it was by the bushel. <laughs> Uh, uh, I've got this notebook here to keep me straight, but I need to tell you this story. Uncle Henry had a son that owned a, a small airplane. Now this was back when McGee Tyson was a wide place in the road on the New Knoxville Highway. And Cousin Eddie Myers had a small plane, and he would fly down to Pennington County, Nile, Georgia, and visit with his parents. And on a Sunday afternoon, if there was a couple of cases of cork mason jars sitting in the back seat, I'll leave that up to you to guess what it was. <laughs> but uh, Sherman got the itch. He got the Georgia itch. And he moved to Georgia. <laughs> in the dead of winter, they loaded all of their belongings up in a wagon, a little bit of team of horses, with a tarp over the top. Now, ladies, I want you to imagine, if you can, loading all of your home equipment, your, your cook stove, things that you can last summer, uh, your bedding, and the chicken cook on the back, heading out in the wintertime, going to move. I just can't find that. And had a, plus the chickens, they had a milk cow tied behind the truck, behind the, behind the wagon. I'm glad, glad that you got this water.
as they were as they were traveling late one evening, just about dusk and dark, or barely about froze to death. Sherman spots a house, a big farmhouse, and the barn down in the lane. He turns in, goes to the barn, takes the harness off his horses, takes them to the creek and waters them, puts them in the stable, and pulls some hay out of the barn loft, feeds them, and then goes back to the house, knocks on the door, and asks the guy, Could you put us up for the night? <laughs> <laughs> the guy tells Sherman, "Well, sure, you're welcome. Bring your wife on in. Take your take your team on to the barn. Take care of them." Sherman said, I "Already have." <laughs> and Sherman gladly accepts the offer. The guy says, "We've got some leftovers. You're welcome to for supper." Sherman would gladly accept the offer of a half a dozen of cornbread and some buttermilk, some beans, and about a pound of butter sitting on the table. The woman of the house was amazed at Sherman's appetite. And she finally says, Mr. That butter costs 10 cents a pound. He said, as he grabbed the last piece of cornbread and forks the last pat of butter, he said, it's worth ever since. <laughs> the, <clears throat> the next morning at breakfast, uh, another family member was there. And he was a dwarf, a bitty guy. Long hair, long black stringy hair, and full face beard. And Sherman just couldn't keep from staring at him. The little guy finally got tired of Sherman stared and said, I'll bite you. <laughs> Sherman, for once in his life, he was at a loss for words. He said, Fairly, we best be on our way. <laughs> they, they landed in Georgia. Crash. Well, this caused Sherman's loan to become due and payable, and he couldn't pay it, and he had to come back to Case Cove. And he moved back in to Case Cove. He moved into the Spratlin house with Grandmother Maggie. Grandfather Pete had passed away in 1916. Now, I need to tell you about the Spratlin house. It was, a, it was a log house, two room structure with a loft where all the company could sleep. And the Spratlin house played an important part of my family's life. My two older brothers were born there. And my grandmother, Maggie, lived there. And it's located just beyond, how many are familiar with Gatesco? Got a bunch of folks that know Cage Go. The Spratlin House was located just beyond the Missionary Baptist Church. You're familiar with that. And you cross Taylor Branch, go up and you start up the hill. That's Caz Hill. John Caz Myers on the property. They're on the right. And up the top of the hill, you make a left and go out, and there's a huge pull off. They used to call it the Myers Pull Off, but they've named it to Wildlife Outlook Outpost 27 or something like that now. They really don't want to see any people living over there. <laughs> this, this overlook was overlooking my grandfather, Peter Myers, was farm. Someone asked my uncle Charlie Myers one time, how much land did your dad own? He said, I don't know, I don't think he did either. But he had upwards of 400 acres from one side, from one side of the coast to the other side. Now, 
just beyond that huge pull-off, on the right side of the road, there's enough room for two or three cars to park. And if you pull off there and follow the path up the hill, you'll wind up at the Pearl Harbor Tree. Anybody know about the Pearl Harbor Tree? Well, I might as well tell you. My dad, transplanted dad, December the 7th, 1941, when he learned that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor, he went to the mountain behind our house and transplanted that little tree to our front yard and he put a rim around it to keep the boys from running over with the lawnmower. If you go up there and look, you see the trees, you can't see nothing. But back when we lived there, that's where I was born, on that hill. You could see from the pinnacle in the east to the Gregory Ball in the west. You know, we had a panoramic view of Case Cove from that hill. This area that I'm talking about was once known as Myerstown. And it was descendants from Baldy John Myers and my great grandfather Daniel Hamilton Myers. Uh, he, that, my grand, great grandfather, went into Case Cove somewhere around 1870, and he took his three youngest sons. He raised the family there and took Lisa Cove, but he moved to Case Cove because Baldy John was already over there. His brother was already there, and he took with him. Dan Myers Jr., Peter Myers, and Uncle Abraham Myers. He took his three youngest sons to Cage Hill. And Baldy John and those three sons are the ones that began the Myers generations in Cage Hill. I want to tell you this. The last wheat crop that my dad planted in the cove was combined and stored in the in the Stratton house. And I remember riding the combine with Rufus Cody driving the tractor and my brother Wayne tying the sacks. <clears throat> now, I need to get back to Sherman and Parley. The return to case to the coal was uneventful until they got to the to the ferry on the Little Tennessee River. And the sheriff was looking for someone. And Parley was shivered again, but it wasn't from being so as as being cold. Sherman had four cases of liquor gone under the wagon seat covered up with quilts. <laughs> but anyway, the sheriff told the sheriff, said, get her over there to that house and let her warm up. Before she freezes to death. But that's not the end of the story. They finally get to Cage Cove. Sherman Myers is the only man ever to haul whiskey into Cage Cove. <laughs> it always came the other way. <laughs> the men were. The word got out about the hall, the men were chuckling about it, the women were trying not to talk about it, and the constable, when he found about it, he wasn't pleased at all. Dad and Uncle Charlie helped hide the goods down around the Blue Spring. And if you, I'll tell you just in the general direction where the Blue Spring is, it's, it's just past the, the Missionary Church, and make that little left turn looking across the cove. If you go from to the almost the creek down through there, that's where the, it was a marshy area, and a huge cold, cold spring bowl up there. And it was fenced off to keep the cattle out. And Dad and Uncle Charlie had Sherman hide the liquor in that in that area, and then they turned the cattle in to. Trump out the wagon tracks. <laughs> a few days later, mom and dad were sitting on the front porch. Mom was churning one of those old time churns. And they saw they saw the constable coming down the road. 
he was riding on a horse and he turned into her driveway and he started up and it's a blue bit of a loop coming back into the back side of the house and while he was coming up the loop, dad went into the house and got a, got a quart of the goods and brought it and put it on uh, in the churn, set it on the dash, <laughs> put the lid back on and mom she, she kept churning. <laughs> well the constable come in and dad bids him to come in and sit down and visit and he did, he come in and sit down and talk a few minutes but he got up left. He knew that dad wasn't the, wasn't the moonshine. It was, the constable by the way was a descendant he was a distant cousin. He was a descendant of Baldy John Myers, so he, he knew Dad wasn't a good boy. Now I'm getting kind of back to getting back to Sherman. He once said, "Guy, I'd break a peavey handle just to hear it snap." Anybody know what a peavey is? It's a tool used to roll logs around when you're logging. You need that beefy to roll logs where you can get hooked to it. Some people call them a cant hook, but a cant hook is used around a sawmill more than a beefy. And he said he'd break that peavy handle. It's a huge thing made out of oak, usually. He was three foot long. And he, he said he'd break that thing with just for, to hear it snap. And he'd be swinging an axe, a double bitted axe, a hair axe. Every lick, he swung, ha, ha. Every lick, the chip flies, he swung that axe. <laughs> he, this man loved to go to the back porch, start spreading the house, and holler. It sounded much like a Tarzan yell, but it would come, it would echo back from across the cove. And it would aggravate his next door neighbor, <laughs> distant cousin, Cory Myers, born to no end. She had on occasion pointed out some of Sherman's mis misdeeds. Now, for some reason, the boring girls made some not so kind remarks about Uncle Sherman's appearance. And he usually did need a shave and a haircut. But these girls, uh, for whatever reason, made up some stories and said some bad things. But he composed a limerick. Nothing written down, it was all in his head. And the only, only line that I can remember, Cordy Boring's daughters were laying out in the sun and showing their hind quarters. <laughs> you, your, your dad told me that years and years ago. Uh, while working at the logging camps uh, at Tremont, he usually worked at Tremont. It required him to leave home Sunday at about dinner and walk to the logging camp getting there in time for supper and a hard week's work. On Friday and payday, he would head out back to the cove on Shanks Mare, arriving home about midnight. He would find his supper in the warming closet of the old cook stove. He'd shave and bathe, he'd eat supper, shave and bathe, slap on some of that good smell and stuff and then on to bed. One night as he was getting into bed, apparently he laid that little hand on that clean shaved face. Said, young man, you better get out of here. Old Whiskers will be here soon. <laughs> sure. Sherman asked, someone asked Sherman, as, as big a fellow as you are, how on earth can you take a bath in a number three wash tub? <laughs> he said, well, it's a simple thing. You just step in and wash down as far as possible. And you wash it up far as possible. Then you sit down and wash possible. <laughs> 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 
sermon was wild and woolly. But he had a hard go. Uh, I stayed with him many times. After they moved out of Katie's School, he had a place there next to Laurel Lake there in Townsend. It was a good visit, but there was one problem. They went to bed before dark. And here I was sitting on the porch listening to the Katie digs. Anybody ever heard of Katie Dig before? <laughs> on, a, on a rare trip to Knoxville, Sherman ran across uh, some men fighting roosters, game roosters. And seeing the money change hands, he got the bright idea of raising these chickens to fight. But bad luck followed this adventure. He paid a dollar each for a hen and a rooster. But bad luck followed when the rooster got out and went to Mary Boring's barn where a big old bop dominant a rooster killed him. Right. It was so much for that adventure. Someone asked Sherman about a bottle of liquor bottle laying by the cellar door. He said, don't bother that. That's a hundred acre farm we in there. He also said, it don't take nigh as much water to make a pot of coffee as some folks think. He said, if you tell someone a lie and they don't believe it, it's not a lie. <laughs> he said, if a, if a, if the coffee will just about float the horseshoe, it's about right. Mom told me this about Uncle Sherman when I was a, when I was real small, a few months old. Sherman would drop by just about every morning and get me on his, he'd cross his leg and get me on his foot and bounce me up and down and sing to me. But I figured out over the years, the main reason he came, he knew that Mom always had that big old coffee pot sitting on the stove about a half full of coffee. And it didn't bother him if it was cold or hot. He didn't really love his coffee. Mom was, uh, Mom was washing one time there. And there was a spring or just off the hill from the Spratton house. That's where we kept our butter and milk in the summer to keep the boy. But Mom was there washing one time and Sherman came happen by. There was some wood there, and Sherman was busting that wood for the fire. And apparently he came out on the end of the porch, and it's just 30 yards or so down where the spring was, and she hollered, Sherman! No answer from Sherman. Sherman! No answer. Third time she really yelled, If I was down there, I'd kick your... Blankety blank blank people. Sherman took that old big foot and stood, stood a block of wood up on his hand. Said, Here's you something to stand on. <laughs> <laughs> During all this, Mom was looking for a place to hide. She 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 was, as they say, long beat out. Now, I'll tell you about John Wright. I mentioned him earlier. He was a character. He had a good spinner of yarns also. They, John Wright had a small store there uh, as you go in to drive out. Some loafers, he and some loafers are sitting there talking and they heard Sherman coming up the road on Powderface. That was a little gray mare. And they, they hollered, hey Sherman, stop and tell us one. Sherman didn't slow down. He said, sorry boys, preacher John the Camel has died and I'm on the way to help dig his grave. And John Wright was thinking, well if preacher John is dead, I need to go help too. About that time I saw preacher John drive behind his car. <laughs> Sherman, he ran out of coffee one time. Now, 
that before I, I don't remember any grocery stores being in Case Code, but uh, before my time, there were a whole three or four stores in Case Code. But in my time, we depended on, on what we call the rolling store. It was a converted school bus with the seats had been taken out and groceries had been stacked in their own shelves. He was, uh, he ran out of coffee. And it was a few days till the road store could be there. So he saddled up out of face and crossed the mountain. He went across Reese Mountain, across Cove Mountain, across Reese Mountain, down into where John Wright's store was. And he got, got his coffee and headed back. It was a cold January day, sleep falling. He was shivering in the saddle as he went. Crawford Oliver came by. He was a case co resident. He came by in a Model T Ford. Sherman flags him down. Says, How about a ride? Crawford says, Sure, get in. But what about your horse? Sherman said, Oh, she knows the way. She'll be fine. Crawford kept looking back, looking at the little mare. And finally he said, Sherman, she's right on our bumper. And she got her left ear laid back. What's going on? Sherman said, you better get over. She's fixing the face. <laughs> Let me give me another sip of water. First place it hit, 
It was thrown in the back of his head in the middle of that bike rock road. The guy in the car was trying to keep from laughing. And between, <clears throat> between gas for breath, he said, Mister, you heard? Turner said, Heard hell, I'm guilt. <laughs> He's picking, picking growl up his gal. <coughs> the guy erupted in laughter. They said he was still laughing when they talked, when they talked out at the top, top of the gas hill. One cold winter night, the sermon heard something in his chickens. And heard a dog barking and the chickens are squawking. He jumped out of the bed and grabbed his hat, and pulled his boots on. And as he went out the front door, he grabbed that 12 gauge off from over the door, over the door. Outside, now picture this. Outside, dressed only in his hat and his boots and his underwear. Long hours. The guy with the flap in the back. <laughs> he went to where the chickens were, and he was had his finger on both triggers looking, looking. About that time, Big Red the dog found out that Sherman's flap wasn't but <laughs> he, he cold knows the Sherman was causing the full of shots. Pull both triggers at the same time. <laughs> this uh, sent two loads of buckshot up into the tree. Wiping out two hands in the, in the bobcat that was harassing the chicken. Mission accomplished. <laughs> but plus, there was two hands for the cook pot and a good bobcat belt. <laughs> now, old Red, he was a champion. All, had, all Sherman had to do was put a drying board on the front porch. The red, this is these were boards that the belts were put on to dry and stretch. And all Sherman had to do was put a board on the front porch. And Big Red would go find a cone to fish. <laughs> <laughs> this worked well enough. Until Mary <laughs> left her ironing board on the front porch one day. <laughs> as far as I know, old Red's still over there coursing in the hills and hogs. <laughs> if you were to see him, you'd toss him a chicken bone or something. He's bound to be younger. One of Sherman's business partners thought that he was consuming too much of their product. This brought on a heated debate. And when the argument was over, Sherman turned and was walking away. And the man called his name, and as Sherman turned, the guy hit him in the face with a rock held in his hand. Flattened poor Sherman's nose even more. He was already flat from all the cops he had in. But it flattened his nose even more. Sherman said later, I looked at that so-and-so over the sides of my 30-30 several times. I just haven't had the part to pull the trigger. And I, some of you would know the family's name if I called it. <laughs> oh, this is a good news. One night Sherman was trying to slip in without waking barely. Now back in the day, it was a custom to have at least two beds in the living room next to the bar. Anyway, Sherman was trying to slip in and he thought he had it made so he was backing up to the hearth to warm him up and he stepped on the catch table. <laughs> of course, this brought up a huge protest from the cat. And apparently he raised up in the bed What's going on? I've never heard such a racket in my life. What's going on? What time is it anyway? Sherman said, oh, I guess it's about nine o'clock. The old clock started to bomb. 
and it didn't quit bonging until it bonged 12 times. <laughs> Barely gives Sherman a lecture about being out late and lying about it. Sherman breaks into tears. Barely says, what's wrong with you now? Sherman said, here we've been married all of these years. And you'll believe in no war out clock before you believe in me. <laughs> sure. Hey, Rihanna, you kind of keep time on me, will you? During a rare drought, Case Cove is a seldom do you have to drive from Case Cove. It, we had, the elevation is just a little bit higher than Tuckaloochee Cove. And it was an ideal place to raise all kinds of fruit. Apples thrived there. My dad had an orchard behind the house, and I guess he had, I don't know, seven or eight different kinds of apples in there. But during a rare time of a drought, Sherman felt impressed to pray for rain. And he said, Lord, just a quarter's worth. Just a quarter. Well, that night it come a cloud bust. And it washed to the bean pass along the stair branch away. He said, if I'd have known it's the chief, I'd just ask for a nickel for it. <laughs> I don't know. We may have to have about two minutes. About ten minutes, I think, may work out then. Now this is good in here. Back when the barter system was in effect, that's back when you could trade eggs at the store for your grocery. Mom did it many times. Sherman took a bunch of eggs to John Wright's store. And later, John Wright discovered some of the eggs were bad. And he, when he saw Sherman, he called Sherman's land on Hey, some of the eggs were bad. Sherman said, it's a fire trade. Did that go on? It was so bad. When I finished my dog, he'd quit eating and lick his behind to get the taste out of him. <laughs> <laughs> Sherman was, uh, he was relaxing one time at John Bye's store with R.C. Cole and a Roman sandwich. A man came in and asked for a half a piece of stove pie. Half a piece of stove pie. The German thought this was kind of odd, you know, half a piece of stove pie. But he said, no, just wait a minute, I'll go get John Wright. He found John Wright in the back of the store and said, there's an idiot out there that's wanting a half a piece of stove pie. And about that time he realized the guy had fallen in. The end. And he said, this is the only one the other day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Bible says that a very heart does good like a medicine. And I fully believe that. And if I can give you a chuckle or a laugh here today, then I've accomplished what I've come for. I don't think that Sherman ever saw a football game. If he did, I don't know what it would have been. But he gave my brother Wayne some good advice. He said, make that feller on the other side ready to see you coming. <laughs> That's about what it boils down to. Sherman rode a powder face to the local grocery store. And as usual, there were three or four loafers sitting there on the bench. It was a, the gas pump, one of the old time ones with the glass bowl on top that you had to pump it to get the gas up. But there's a guy jumped up and grabbed that hole and, how much do you need? German jerked that little mare and she wheeled her butt around to pin that guy to the gas pump. German said, little gas, please. <laughs> I remember going to uh, the potato branch to watch Uncle Sherman try out a new Alice Chalmer tractor. I think it was a B 
steel wheel, no hydraulics, no electrical system, hand crank. It had a long spring loaded lever to raise and lower the pop the, the plow. And no one but Sherman would have had the strength to raise the plow out of the ground anyway. But he was bouncing around on that tractor, it was a comical sight to see. That's probably the first time he ever tried to drive a vehicle. He was like my dad, he was more at home with the team horses. But dad wasn't impressed at all with the tractor. He and Uncle Charlie owned a, uh, what was the generation? McCormick Deer. They had bought a McCormick Deer years and years before. But dad wouldn't drive a tractor. He wouldn't drive a car. He told mom, if I get under the steering wheel, my knees start bumping together. <laughs> but he was like Sherman. He was going home with a team of horses. Sherman said one time that he and Perley had moved so many times that uh, if you got close to the house with the team of horses and the wagon, that the chickens would go get in the cook. <laughs> After moving to Laurel Lake, uh, he cleared that place with his, his brute strength and stubbornness and his little mare. And he had rented from pastor to a neighbor, Clyde Sullivan. And Clyde told this story. They had tip of Clyde. They had delivered the, the cows, and he and Sherman were standing looking at those long valleys, that lush grass growing. It's where the golf course is now. Clyde said, they've sure got plenty of room. Sherman said, they can go from hell to the shining rock. <laughs> well, now this story was told to me by my father-in-law, Clark Adams, years and years after it happened. Clark was there in case you told in the CC. Sherman's early riser always drunk a lot of strong, hot, black coffee. And sometimes it would act as a laxative. <laughs> and one morning, as he was hurrying to the outhouse, a load of the CC guys were coming by in the truck. And they thought it was hilarious to see this big guy run to the toilet. And they hollered, hurry, you ain't gonna make it. Next morning, Sherman was standing out at the edge of the road with a shotgun cradle in his arm. He said, you so-and-sos say good morning, Mr. Mars, or hello, Sherman. Don't you ever make fun of me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> now, knowing these two fellas, my father-in-law, Clark Adams and Sherman, more than likely, now I can't say this is a fact, But more than likely, they got acquainted over each other's moonshine. <laughs> Sherman took great pride in his hunting dogs, especially his bear dogs. A lot of them old timers preferred bear meat over beef or pork. And he had traded for three pups Poker Joe, Rock, and Grind. On a rest break, they told Sherman, oh, Rip, whoop, and puffs, they almost and puffs, almost grown. They turned them out one at a time, oh, Rip, whooped them. Well, later, a few months later, Sherman said, I don't believe old Rip and Hannah and dogs now, they've grown up. So he says, turn them out. They turned them out one at a time, oh, Rip prevailed again. Rip was the ugliest dog that you ever saw. Little short legs, brown, blotchy, black spots on him, weighed about 40 pounds. They would clip his hair in the summer, but he'd leave a wisp on the end of his tail. He looked like a small lion. He, that dog hated snakes. And he would kill any kind. It didn't matter if it was a rattlesnake or black snake or whatever. Old Rip would kill it. 
When Z got back home out of the army, he was he was in India. And my other brother Clay was in the Philippine Islands. But when they got home, old Rip was old, deaf, couldn't see good. They jumped up on the porch and stomped his feet, hollered, Rippy! That old dog stood up, wagged his tail. He remembered the master's voice. In the summer of 1945, after Dad's death in April, my brother Wayne, we had moved out of Case Cove in 1945. But my dad went back over there to take care of the cattle and stuff. And he was out with John Chip, who was plowing his garden, and he had an arm attack and died out there. But that summer, my brother Wayne was 16 years old, and he had, back in April, his dad had died. He actually borrowed a car from her neighbor and went to Sevierville and made the funeral arrangements for dad being 16 years old. Uh, Sherman, Wayne was facing this dilemma with all that hate put up. Well, here comes Sherman with Tommy Bursfield. And they worked a week putting that hay in the barn. Back in them days, he put it in loose. He didn't, didn't have no bailer. All I could do was carry water. I was eight years old. And after a week's work, and with a whole lot of persuasion, Mom finally gets Tommy to take some money. She pays him. Sherman absolutely refused any money. Mom goes in the smokehouse and comes out with a whole piece of side meat, bacon, cured bacon, puts it in a sack and gives it to Sherman. Big tears run down his face. He said, Thank you, my boy. Thank you. Couldn't have been anything better. Another good thing about the hay, it was put up with loose out of the mansion. It was hauled in on a, on a wagon, and there was a fork. Put a system in the barn and out top of the barn, ran a fork out and set it in the hay, pulled it up, and it picked the hay up and went into the barn. Wayne would be on the way and be on the wagon, setting the hook. Sherman would be in the barn, putting it where he wanted it, and Tommy would be pulling off the mule tank. When Wayne got the fork set, Sherman would holler at the top of his voice, holler, Tommy, holler, holler, God bless you. I'm about done, man. How am I doing on time? It's right on time. Now this, now this one caps the cake. This is the icing on the cake. And Sherman would tell this whopper without a trace of a smile, once while he was cutting hay, he cut the rear legs off of one of his prized root sows. And he pulls her over to the side thinking that she was done for. Well, in a few days, he noticed she was pulling herself around with her front legs. And he builds a sulky with two wheels and two poles up to her, through her sides, fastens her body with leather straps. Well, it come time to take the cattle and hogs to the mountain, having up on the chestnut drop. He was kind of undecided, but he finally went ahead and took the, the sow to the mountain. And it came time to go get him. He went to the, back to the mountain and he called and called, thinking a bear had devoured her. Finally, she so showed up, still on the wheels, still on the socket. And she had 10 bigs following her. <laughs> and they were on wheels too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that about does on the ground.
got a minute or two and a half? Yeah. We might, if someone might have a question, you know, about to go over it, I'd be welcome to. When they left Cage Cove to go to Georgia, do you know which route they took out of Cage Cove? They went out Parsons Branch. I've heard Uncle Charlotte tell about herding cattle through that area, throughout Parsons Branch, through the mountains into North Carolina. And he did it with a horse and two dogs. Herded cattle. Tell them about your panel later, your panel discussion tonight. Oh. Your panel discussion. Oh, later. yeah. I'm going to, at 7 30 tonight, this evening. I'm going to be on a panel. We're going to be talking about to go away and some questions. It's Steve Weber and Richard Go. He has a book out here on the table at your right down this hallway. Just a couple of comments. I have a great grandmother on my mother's side. Her name was Perry Lee. Really? Yeah. yeah. So no, I hadn't heard of her. No, no, no. And my dad moved from Gilmer County, which is next to Fannin County, into Knox County. So he came to the direction. <laughs> How about that? Strange world. Yeah. Are any of the cabins left that either you or your father or Sherman lived in still in the cove? I'm sorry. Are any of the cabins that oh, you no, no. no, they're all gone? No, they tore our house down within 10 days after we moved. Dad built that house in 1926, along with Uncle Charlie. Uncle Charlie helped him build it. What's your story about how Cage Cove got its name? I've heard he's a Cherokee chief, and I've heard this and that and the other. I really don't know. Well, I thank you for your time, Tim.